In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about frequency distributions. In the last video on frequency distributions, we looked at discrete variables and how we might make a univariate frequency distribution based on that variable. For this video, we're going to look at continuous variables, things like age or crime rate, that have, in theory, an infinite number of possible outcomes. And we're going to show that we're going to have to divide or make intervals or categories to put these um, put our observations into to summarize the data. The first example we're going to look at looks at crime rate. The FBI collects a number of crime statistics. They collect the number of different kinds of crimes like murder, rape, robbery, assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Those are called index crimes. And from that, they develop an index crime statistic. We're going to take the index crime statistic and calculate it as a rate. What we're going to end up having is the number of crimes per 100,000 people. You can see a little bit to the left in the middle, I've listed out some states and some counties and their crime rate. So for example, in Lawrence County, Georgia, there were 4,358 index crimes for every 100,000 people. The per 100,000 people is a way of standardizing the data so we can compare the crime rates among counties that don't have large populations to those that do. Let's go ahead and look at the entire variable, not just a little subset of it. This screen shows us um, my favorite statistical application, which is called Stata. Down at the bottom of the screen, I've issued a command or typed out a command that will show us what the data look like. And I'm going to uh, use the Enter key now and look at our first block of data. So here we have partially for the state of Alabama. Um, the different counties, Ottawa, Baldwin, Barber, Bibb, Blunt, and so forth, and their crime rates. So uh, let's say uh, Barber County, for example, had 2,993 index crimes per 100,000 people. Down at Choctaw County, they only had 215 index crimes per 100,000 people. I'm just going to move through the data a little bit. So you can see Alabama is a large state with a lot of different counties. The next state is Alaska then Arizona, Arkansas. Arkansas seems to have lots of counties. California is a very large state. goes on for a while. Colorado. And you can see as I just kind of leaf through or page down through all the data, ending up with Wyoming, that there's a lot of counties. There's over 3,000 counties and a lot of different crime statistics. So while here we have the most granular or accurate information, to some extent it's the least useful until we do some kind of summarization of the data. Now over here we can see that I've picked out the state of Maryland and all the counties in Maryland and their crime rates. And I've taken um, the crime rate from zero crimes up to more than 10,000 crimes per 100,000 people and made a little table. And what we're going to end up doing is we're going to assign, for example, all the counties that have uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 crimes per 100,000 and put them into that one interval that contains a total of 719 counties. Similarly, if we look at the counties like Somerset, Allegheny, and so forth, they all have roughly between uh, three and 4,000 crimes per 100,000. So we'd put them into a different interval. And then I've picked out the high crime counties at the bottom, Prince George's County and Baltimore City. And they would go into the interval 7,000 to 7,999. So this process by which we take the total crime rate, going from zero to the greatest uh, crime rate, and we divide it up into smaller intervals, in this case 11 intervals, each one approximately 1,000 crimes wide. We then sort our data and just put our, and just count the number of cases in each interval. So this is called grouping data. When we have continuous measures, we collapse them into fewer categories. And we do that to summarize the data, so we go from having that big long list of data that's very difficult to interpret to a smaller number so we can see what the shape or nature of, in this case, uh, crime is. We treat our measurement interval, treats all the cases between the lower and upper limits as being the same. So once we get into an interval, say, between 1,000 and 1,999 index crimes per 100,000, if you fall in that interval, we treat you the same as everybody else. To do this, to make these intervals, we have to define the intervals as being mutually exclusive and exhaustive. By mutually exclusive, we mean that when we put a case into an interval, when we decide what interval it belongs in, it goes in one and only one interval. Well, by exhaustive, we mean that there's an interval for every case. Usually when we do this kind of collapsing or aggregation, 
somewhere between 6 and 20 intervals tends to produce a pretty aesthetically pleasing frequency distribution and we can make an associated graphic and it's typically very understandable by any audience. Let's look at a graphic based on the crime uh, rate. Here I haven't done any collapsing at all. Each column is for a different crime rate. So there's mostly there's one column for every county and you can see it's kind of a jumbled mess because you know very few counties overlap and so there's just a lot of bars and it's kind of a busy graphic. If I were to collapse this into a smaller number of categories, I could produce something like the graphic on the lower left. This also is not a very good graphic, and I think these two highlight the tension between uh, the tension we have in producing aggregated graphs or aggregated frequency distributions. On the one hand, the top graphic doesn't do enough summarizing of the data. It's way too much detail. On the other hand, the graph on the bottom, there's too few categories. We're throwing too many objects into each category. And we're, when we're um, obscuring the relationship, we're obscuring the look of the distribution by having too few categories. Somewhere between these two extremes is something that will work for an audience. There is no um, absolute statistical answer to this. This is one of aesthetics, and it's one that you have to play with. Here's the table in the graph that I decided upon as being the best representation of the data. I've made each of these intervals approximately 1,000 crimes wide, and that gives me 11 intervals. I can see that, that there's a large number of relatively low crime counties, uh, up to, say, 2,999 crimes per 100,000 people. And then um, there are fewer. There's a long tail to the right as the number of crimes increases, but there's fewer and fewer counties. Looking at the graphic in the table, you can see that the graph represents the numbers in the table. I've used that percentage column to represent the height of the bars, and I've placed a bar over the midpoint of each one of those intervals. So technically, the limits in this graph, the upper limit of one bar, is overlapped or equal to the lower limit of the bar above it. And we have to come back and figure out what we mean by upper and lower limits, and we're going to look at two different kinds of limits, apparent limits and true limits. Now let's just take a look at a single number. When we have a continuous variable, technically there's an infinite number of possible values that we can report. That is, we can put things on a number line and the number line has an infinite number of points. When we actually do measurement, we have a finite measurement process or a measuring instrument and we usually get numbers that have finite precision. So on the one hand, in theory, we have infinite precision, but in practice, there's finite precision. So you can see over on the right in the graphic, there's somebody standing on a scale, and the scale shows that they weigh 115 pounds. As a continuous measurement, weight could be further subdivided or, made or measured more precisely, but the limits of this particular measuring device are to the nearest pounds or the ones unit. So if our measurements are on a continuous variable, are numbers that have integers. Our precision, measure, precision of measurement is one unit. So while we observe a value of 115 in this case, we really believe that the actual number is somewhere between 114.5 pounds and 115.5 pounds. What we really say is we report 115, but we understand that it represents a range of real or possible values. It's those real values that are the limits of our measurement. So we have a lower true limit in this case, which is 114.5, and we have an upper true limit, which is 115.5. Now, instead of measuring just a single number like um, weight, 115 pounds, what if we had intervals that have an upper limit and a lower limit? Then we can also define, and if we call that an a lower apparent limit and an upper apparent limit, we can then calculate the true limits, true lower and true upper limits. So let's go back to our crime example. I've shown the apparent limits here. And so let's look at the first category, 0 to 999, and then the second interval is 1,000 to 1,999. Notice that those values don't overlap. That is, the upper apparent limit of the lower category or interval, 999, is not equal to the lower apparent limit of the category above it, that is, the 1,000. There's a gap between 999 and 1,000. 
When you produce a table for publication, you will always use the apparent limits. And that's going to tell your reader how precise your data are measured. So in this case, we know that the, act that the precision of the data is to the ones place. So to actually divide our cases and put them into these intervals without, and making them so they're mutually exclusive, we need to define true limits which are going to be one place more precise than the apparent limits. Those are not reported to, to your reader. They're not put in a table or graphic. They're simply used to, uh, to uh, figure out how wide the interval is to place cases into it so they can be unambiguously assigned to one and only one interval. There's a pretty simple way to do this. And basically, if you look at the last number, so we have, say, 9999 nine, 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 and the number above it, 1,000, and you know that the next number in precision would be a 0.5. If you always add and subtract 0.5, you'll always subtract 0.5, well, you'll always subtract 5 from the lower limit and add 5 to the upper limit. In this case, it's 0.5. In another case, it might be 0.05 or 0.005. You'll be able to define the true limits. You can see that the apparent limits don't overlap. The upper apparent limit of an interval say 999, is less than the lower apparent limit of the interval above it. But for the true limits, they overlap exactly. So in that first interval, the first outcome, we have an upper true limit of 999.5. And in the interval above it, we have a lower true limit of 999.5, the same number. Those numbers can overlap. It's OK, because we don't have numbers in our data set accurate to, to the tenths place. And therefore, nothing can fall. Uh, exactly at the point 0.5. This is how we guarantee unambiguous division of our cases across these intervals. Let's look at another example. Here I'm showing interval apparent limits that range in the first interval 90.00 to 99.99. The next interval 100.00 to 109.99. Again, because these are the apparent limits, these are the, these are the numbers that we would put on a table or a graphic, you can see that there's a gap between them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add 5 to the upper limit and subtract 5 from the lower limits. Now, actually, it's not going to be exactly 5. It'll be 0 .005. A simple way to figure this out is to, to figure out how big the gap is, because the limit will always be halfway between the gap. So just looking at the first two intervals, I can see that the lower true limit of the upper uh, category is 100, and the lower true limit of the category below it is 99.9. .9. And if I take that gap and I divide it by 2, which gives me 0 .005, that gives me the amount I need to subtract from all the lower apparent limits and add to all the upper, tr upper apparent limits. As a little bonus here, and something we'll need later on, if we take half the distance between the true limits, if we, if we take the average of the lower and upper true limits, we get the category midpoint. And when we make a graphic, we're going to need the true limits and the midpoints, particularly if you're going to draw them by hand. This slide I'm not going to spend much time describing, but you certainly can pause the video and take a look at it. The only difference between um, this particular page and the other one is that I've changed the level of precision. So on the slide before, we were precise to two decimal places, to the hundredths place. On the top, here we are, we have accuracy or precision to the ones place, and on the bottom to the tenths place. And you can see again that I'm simply adding and subtracting 5, but it's going to be 0.5 or 0 0.05 to the apparent limits to get to my true limits. The last thing I want to discuss when we look at frequency distributions are what are called cumulative frequency distributions. The uh, table at the top um, is a pretty typical table. Here I've taken um, uh, the age variable from the general social survey and I've divided it up into intervals that are approximately 10 years wide. Uh, I do want to point out two exceptions to this table. The first interval is labeled 10 to 19 and that's technically not correct. 
in the GSS, only people who are 18 years old or older can participate. So really, that interval should read 18 to 19. But I made it 10, partially so I can make a point about labeling tables and trying to be as accurate as possible, and also because sometimes people find it confusing because it's a different interval width. Also, the interval labeled 18 to 89 is also not technically correct. The age variable in the general social survey is what's called top-coded. So what, when anybody has an, an age of 89, what that actually means is they're 89 years or older. And they do that to protect the, uh, the identities of um, older people who are, who are willing to participate in the general social survey. Because there are so few of them, it might be possible to look at a number of variables and combine that with the age variable and triangulate to figure out the identities of people. And so to mass them, they just lump them all together into one group. If it says 89 is a person's age in the GSS, they could be 89 or they could be older. Now our frequency distribution here, the first column is just the raw frequency. And in other places, I've labeled that with an italicized lowercase f. Next to that, we have the relative frequency, or the percentage. So we're just taking the raw frequencies, dividing by the total number of cases, and multiplying by 100 to get to the percentages. And then we have the cumulative percentages. So if we just start cumulating the values in the percentage column, so 1.82 in the 10 to 19 goes, um, 1.82 becomes 1.82 in the cumulative column. If we take 1.82 plus 16.91, we then put in the cumulative column 18.73. If we take the 18.73 plus 21.72, we get 40.44 and so forth. Now, the cumulative distributions are often useful for us for figuring out things like where the median is. That is, if we found the location in this distribution where um, half the cases fell below and half the cases fell above a particular age, we'd have the median um, value. So the median is one kind of measure of central tendency that we'll discuss in another video. Just to show you one example of this, just looking at the category labeled 40 to 49, you can see in the table that there were six, that 63 percent of the sample was 49 years old or younger. And when if I draw a horizontal line from the top of that bar, you can see it falls right at about 63 percent. That's it for our discussion of how to uh, examine frequency distributions when you have continuous data and collapsing your variables. Um, don't forget we have some videos, uh, really example videos, of how to do these kinds of problems. This is a more general discussion. And we're going to have another video on how we make these graphics and how you can make a cumulative uh, uh, distribution or a histogram or a bar graph um, of your own data. As usual, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and um, I will do my best to answer them.